So the next presentation is by Marcus Miller. And I think Marcus, if you share it in the screen like William just did or otherwise centrally. Um, my presentation is possibly rather more academic than many of the distinguished policy uh, types that have gone before. So I start with the general idea that the central bank has a task of providing or helping provide public goods uh, where the private sector won't deliver what is socially optimal. And with respect to the central bank, um, I've listed three such public goods. First is price stability. We can all enjoy that um, at the same time. Uh, it's not rivalrous and not ex there's no excludability. And I would just remind some of the listeners that UK inflation went above 20% after OPEC 1. Secondly, uh, financial stability, more controversial obviously in the course of this discussion, uh, especially in banking. And we don't need much reminding that the UK and US banking systems almost collapsed uh, just a few years ago. And thirdly, uh, macroeconomic stability, like now, as financial markets are seizing up. <clears throat> well, starting off with the first of these, <clears throat> um, it does seem to me that <clears throat> in inflation, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there is a sort of prisoner's dilemma in that many, in, in, in an economy with large players like trade unions and so on, um, there is an incentive to move first and gain some purchase relative to other players. So what we have is a kind of prisoner's dilemma, which can, of course, result in a very uh, inferior Nash equilibrium. And hence the, the idea of having some social control that used to be by prices and incomes policy, <clears throat> but that's been superseded by delegating inflation targeting to the central bank. So of course, <clears throat> during the great moderation from the mid 1980s to before the crisis, controlling inflation was the principal objective assigned to the Bank of England. <clears throat> With the UK setting the inflation target, as Ed Balls emphasized, to be pursued uh, using interest rate policy by the Bank of England doing operational uh, control. The policy, I guess, was pretty successful. Unfortunately, it ignored another public good, namely financial stability. Now, preserving financial stability, as Willem just emphasized, has long been an, a key objective of central bank policy by acting as lender of last, last resort to prevent bank runs from leading to banking collapse. In the case of 2008-9, the US Fed actually acted as a global lender of last resort, which it seems to be doing again today. However, with the one-eyed focus on inflation targeting, central banks lost sight of the need to preserve such financial stability. Well, you could argue price stability is a sufficient condition for financial stability. Is that so? Sadly not. The great moderation ended in the great financial crisis. So I'm, I'm gonna focus on financial stability and what follows, but first an image from Homer's Odyssey. <clears throat> Here we have a picture of a central bank like a giant cyclops blinded by one-eyed focus on inflation, but failing to prevent bankers from escaping regulation. Those are the bankers escaping regulation down the bottom left-hand corner of the picture. <clears throat> Next, I turn to what games bankers may play as seen by Bank of England economists. Uh, what they argue, that's uh, David Aikman, Andy Haldane, and Benjamin Nelson in a paper in the EJ, what they argue is due to strategic complementarity, deposit taking bankers may be tempted to take more risk on the grounds that it's more attractive if we all do it. And they have three games, 
The first game is systemic risk shifting. Uh, all the banks are protected by limited liabilities. So expected profits increase as risk increases, as it will do if we all gamble. The second game is keeping up with the Goldman's. <clears throat> Being small and safe, as, as others grow big and gamble, is bad for your reputation. Just remember Bob Diamond, when he was CEO at Barclays Bank, that's what he said almost every day. Thirdly, moral hazard of official creditor bailouts. Governments are more likely to step in if we're all in this together. Edward Kane calls this safety net abuse. <clears throat> I, I now turn to the challenges to the Basel rules that come not from deposit banks, but from shadow banks. Shadow banks are really the uh, more active members of the banking community. <clears throat> and one reason is because they do what Charles Goodhart calls regulatory arbitrage or bound, uh, what he calls the boundary problem. Um, shadow banks grow fast because they're less subject to regulatory control and they're more inclined to hold securitized tradable assets with values marked to market. As a corollary, however, there exist collateral externalities working through asset prices. So aggregate shocks that change the price of risk assets also change the equity of shadow banks. Another aspect of shadow banking is they don't have automatic access to lender of last resort. So they rely on selling assets and are badly exposed to liquidity shocks. Now, the thing about shadow banks is they like to play all those three games we just talked about. Game one, for example, if the riskiness of bank portfolios is not common knowledge, they can get extra profits by taking on tail risk. Shadow banks become risk lovers because they can shift risk onto creditors thanks to li limited liability. Keeping up with the Goldmans, well, that's all about shadow banks. Game three, <clears throat> if they're too big to fail, even shadow banks will be able to pass risk on to the taxpayer, what Ed, Ed, Edward Kane calls safety net abuse. Um, a picture of the moral hazard of limited liability, that's the game one, uh, is, is where shareholders' uh, rate of um, return on equity is a convex function of investment returns. So wider spreads raise expected ROE. So on the horizontal axis, I plotted the investment payoffs. On the vertical axis, there's the return to shareholders. And there's a flaw on the losses of shareholders because of limited liability. So we get this convex function. So if you widen the spread, you get a higher expected rate of return for shareholders. A more pleasant picture or more persuasive picture follows. You may remember the picture of the vampire squid cartoon used to criticize Wall Street investment banks. Well, here they are widening the spread and increasing their own returns. Some policy responses to these problems uh, are, are discussed by these Bank of England economists. Now, one of them is to increase capital requirements for macro prudential reasons, not just micro, but macro prudential reasons. Also, of course, adding liquidity requirements, because if you can't access the central bank, you better have your own liquidity. Um, in the UK, uh, commercial banks ha had in the past taken, over, taken up investment banking so as to boost expected profits. For example, Barclays developed Barcap in order to get a seat on Wall Street. And to compete, the Royal Bank of Scotland went big into subprime. Well, structural separation is trying to reverse this to get investment banking separated from commercial banking. Uh, this is in the Vickers report, and it's an obvious policy response, which is an echo of Glass-Steagall. 
the question I want to raise is, is macro prudential policy enough? Well, Willem Bouter thinks it's too much, but my question is, is it enough? After the Wall Street crash and the banking collapse that followed, that followed major policy intervention, especially the wide ranging Glass-Steagall Act, restored stability and trust in US banking for about 50 years or more. Will the policies of macroprudential regulation do the same after the recent crisis? Well, I'm afraid that the capacity of shadow banking to endanger the, bank, the financial system by taking on excessive risk suggests that macro pru will not be enough without me measures to deal with the agency problems in banking. The question I, I, I want to ask is, are top bankers above the law? It's proved very difficult to show fraudulent intent on the part of high level management of the banks and companies in cases that involve mis-selling of innovative financial products. This has led to a shift from prosecuting high level individuals to prosecuting companies using DPAs, Deferred Prosecution Agreements, where the company, <clears throat> under threat of criminal prosecution, agrees to pay a fine and take measures. However, the very prevalence of DPA settlements shows that their deterrent effect is small, says John Kay. The result is the top bankers enjoy effective immunity from legal action. They are, in some sense, above the law. What can we do about this? There seem to be two ways to go. <clears throat> One is to criminalize reckless behavior, as they have in Iceland, and they put them in jail up near the North Pole, and, the, and also the UK senior persons regime is trying to do this, but failing. A quotation here from Neil Niall Ferguson in the Reith Lectures says that all the detailed regulation in the world will do less to avert a future financial crisis than the clear and present danger in the minds of today's bankers that if they transgress <clears throat> in the eyes of the authority upon whom their business depends, they could go to prison. That's the first route. The second route is a nostalgic return to the days when bankers did not have limited liabilities. Here I want to quote from a recent paper by uh, Rosa Lastra and Charles Goodhart. <clears throat> Whereas outside, notably retail investors still need the protection of limited liability, we advocate moving towards a two tier system for banks with senior managers and others with, inflation, with influence over corporate control having restrictions on limited liabilities. I'll leave Rosa to uh, say more about that proposal to go back to more unlimited liability for senior bankers. I just want to end on possibly a happy note. <clears throat> it seems to me the masters of the universe disgraced themselves by helping bring on the global financial crisis. Can they redeem this now by helping the authorities, helping the Bank of England and the Treasury, <clears throat> to design and implement measures to prevent the global spread of financial instability, for example, by capital controls, like Helen Ray recommends, and to prevent the spread nationally of macroeconomic stability by retrospective income insurance, for example. Not that the Bank of England should do this, but the bankers might be able to help design the policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you also for quoting the paper that Charles and I wrote on this issue, which actually has just been published in the Journal of Financial Regulation.